we owe it to ourselves to make sure our home culture and our work culture supports all of that. And, and some of the things are, are are simple fixes. Some are more complicated, but um, making sure your team takes the vacations that they're allotted, that's a big deal so people mm. can go out, get rested, and come back. is the Brandon Smith Show, and of course, I'm your host, Brandon Smith, and the entire purpose of the show is one singular thing, and that is to help you live a life that much more free from dysfunction. And unfortunately, I can't think of anything that is more reminiscent of dysfunction than things like anxiety and depression. And when I think about anxiety and depression, uh, those are not only blockers for us in our life and career, but I, I see them more prevalent today than perhaps any other time. And when time's our most precious resource and everything is urgent all the time, that's just a breeding ground for challenges like anxiety and depression. And I know I've, I've felt those in my, in my career and life, and I'm sure most people listening have, have, have as well. So to help us on this journey, I've got my great and dear friend, Dr. Arifa Casaboy, to kind of guide us through this. Uh, and so Arifa, I'm really excited to have you back on the show again. Thank you for having me. I always enjoy this. Yeah, I do too. I do too. So just to make sure everyone, for those of the folks who haven't heard you before, you're the Senior Medical Director at WebMD, correct? Yes. Yeah. So in other words, folks, she knows what she's talking about. And she and she is going to help us on this journey. So I want to talk about um, anxiety and depression and would love your guidance on this. But I'd like to kind of take it from a couple angles and then, of course, wherever you'd like to take it. Um, I'd like to take it from the, from the angle of us as uh, our individuals. How, what are some signs we can recognize in ourselves and what are some things we can do to either prevent it or treat it uh, or at least take care of ourselves? And, and then also for those of us that are leading others, leading groups of teams and people, what are some signs that we should be on the lookout for, uh, for those team members that we want to care for as well? Um, so I'll kind of open it with that. W- when you think about anxiety and depression, I would love to get your thoughts on kind of what you're seeing out there today and what are some things that we, we can start to think about? Well, certainly feeling anxious is on the rise. Uh, it's something that's more and more prevalent in our society when you look at measurements done over time. The American Psychiatry Association, they do a survey yearly, and even between 2017 and 2018, they saw um, respondents were saying they were more anxious than they were in the year before. So it's it's pretty interesting wow. how it's happening. Wow, that's not good news. No, no, it's not. It's not good news. Um, there's a lot that can be done about it, though, so that's, that's positive. Uh, but yes, um, in 2017, about 20% of Americans had some sort of anxiety disorder, and that includes generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, uh, panic attacks, I said, um, and social phobia. And then about 7% of the population had a uh, major depressive episode. Wow. And so it's significant. Uh, it means that people that we're walking around talking to at work in the neighborhood, our own family are experiencing this. Yeah. And so you said 20% have some re- yeah. anxiety related disorder, which, which I'm just to make sure I'm clear, that's diagnosed. That doesn't count the folks that maybe yeah. aren't diagnosed or aren't reporting it. Exactly. It's not including that spectrum of feeling anxious which can be appropriate and, and a normal part of our lives. Well, yeah. I don't know which spectrum I fall in, but I, I was raising my <laughs> hand on this one because I, I often wake up and I'll say, okay, Brandon, how do you feel today? How's your anxiety today on a scale of one to 10? And I know if, I, if I'm operating below five, uh, I'm okay. doesn't feel good, but I can function. When I get closer to like a seven or an eight, I need to start re-examining my calendar because it's just not going to play well for me. And it's good. You're self-aware, so I think putting it on a scale is perfect. For some people, one of the questions that's great to ask is, do you feel like you're excessively worrying about something minor? And I remember in the past just cooking dinner and one day stressing out over whether I was going to, you know, do chicken. Um, beans or beef for my, you know, protein for the family. Now that's 
sort of excessive worrying about something that's pretty minor. So that's a good way to for people to take a, a look at what they're worrying about and kind of test themselves to see is it really appropriate. Yeah, and, and on, on the almost the flip side, the the worst for me is when I get generalized anxiety. So I'm anxious, but I have no reason why. I don't know why. Like I can't pin it to anything. That's the worst. Yeah. And I'm sitting there saying, I, I, I've got no reason to be anxious. I have a light day. There's nothing really going on. But I'm just, I can almost feel like my skin's crawling. I mean, it's interesting because uh, so many people aren't able to kind of articulate that and realize that. And then the next step is actually, even if you recognize it, doing something about it. So we know with uh, people that have depression, in 2017, 35% didn't get any treatment at all. And there's repercussions of untreated depression. It's beyond just feeling sad. It, can, it impacts the rest of your life. Yeah, say more about that. So what are some, what are some other ways that that can impact us if we don't seek treatment or get some kind of help? Right. So with uh, depression, it impacts your physical body immediately. So many people will either have a change in appetite where they're eating more or less. Their sleep is impacted, sleeping more or less. Energy is impacted, getting either agitated and um, nervous and irritable, or maybe they're feeling sluggish. Overall, everybody feels fatigued. All of these um, are the immediate impact. But then long term, we know that depression often coexists with another illness. So in terms of psychiatric illnesses, it can exist with uh, anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, um, substance abuse disorder. And with medical conditions, it can exist with diabetes and heart disease. And fortunately, people who have depression and then have another illness, their prognosis is actually much poorer. In fact, they're twice as likely to die, actually, you know, from from untreated um, illnesses because with the depression, you're not as well capable of taking care of the medical, the other medical or psychiatric condition. And then Mm. the other condition makes the depression worse. Similar things happen with anxiety disorders. There's a restlessness that can come with it and muscle tension. Uh, People often talk about not being able to sleep properly, which is a vicious cycle in of itself. They'll feel fatigue and pain becomes a big part of anxiety where people will complain of headaches or stomach aches, um, pain in the shoulders and back. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so it, it, it is truly impacts the entire life and then it impacts everybody around them as well. Yeah. You know, I had no idea depression was such a nasty co-pilot. I didn't yeah. know that. It, it's like it's like that horrible rowdy friend that sits in, next to you while you're driving the car and keeps try, trying to grab the yeah. steering wheel. That sounds like and that's depression. Not good. It's so in, it's so insidious because initially you think, well, I'm feeling down because of this other condition, and then it kind of takes a life of its own. Yeah. Oh, and then now you got both things you've got to deal with. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. And you're trying to work at the same time. Yeah, I'm feeling I'm feeling depressed. Oh, I know. We've got to lighten up this conversation. <laughs> feeling there a little fatigued. Things <laughs> <laughs> you can do. Um, I feel like when someone's at work and they're feeling anxious, there are a couple key steps to help with that. One is, and some of this I've learned from you, and you should jump on in with um, your wonderful suggestions. But one is to challenge the anxiety that you're feeling. Ask um, ask your superiors, your coworkers for a performance evaluation. Mm. If you aren't performing where you need to be, well, they'll tell you, you'll know, and then you can start making changes. If you're inappropriately worrying about something you don't need to worry about, you'll also find out because you're doing the job you need to do. Yeah, that's great. The other, um, the other thing is that mindset is really important. So flipping things from negative to positive um, and looking at that sort of half glass full idea. And that can be difficult to do. Um, Cognitive based uh, therapy is um, one form of talk therapy and other forms as well are really good for challenging that. And they can help you with uh, questions like testing your 
thoughts in the moment and looking at are you really in control of XYZ? Mm. If you can't control it, well, then just let it go. Don't worry about it. The other thing is, and if you do have control, well, then do what you need to do and get on with it. And the other thing is perfectionism is a big issue that can bring a lot of anxiety for people. Mm. And double checking that so that you are instead thinking, what's good enough? Because often good enough really is good enough, and it will help you keep moving along, getting through your day, being successful at multiple things as opposed to getting stuck on one. You know what I love in what you said there is there are so many different ways that we can tackle that and help with some reframing and readjusting. Uh, and in most cases, it involves just talking to another person. And what I love yeah. about that is it can, it can be talk therapy, it can be a professional, but it could also be a colleague or, co or a friend or your boss. I mean, there, there's a lot of yeah. outlets you can find, but have someone else help you with that reframing and in a healthy way, challenge your thinking. So it doesn't Absolutely. have to be perfect or, you, or you're maybe worrying about something that is really not as big of a deal as it feels like it is to you. And I think that's another important thing too. It's not that um, what you're feeling is wrong. It's just helping to reframe it. So it, it, it's, it's not hurting you in, or, or costing you anything. Exactly. And sometimes we get frozen in those feelings when actually there are concrete changes we can make. They feel overwhelming, but if we start talking, we can kind of get a one, two, three, four action plan uh, to tackle a problem. So at work, if you're overloaded, it may be a conversation to really look at what all the work you're doing. What are the true deadlines that need to be met and what deadlines maybe can be postponed? Um, and helping prioritize uh, projects that you're working on to get those steps in place so that you achieve each milestone in a timely manner. And that reduces your stress level. You don't need to like worry about the end goal of the full project, but rather getting to each step along the way, knowing that there's a reason for this project workflow. It was so something very interesting that I think you'd find fascinating. As I'm working with all these different teams and groups and organizations, one of the common workplace cultural norms that people used to do that they're not doing anymore is they don't go out to lunch with their coworkers anymore. <laughs> they don't because they're too busy. So they just sit and they eat by themselves or work by themselves. Yeah, and, I agree. And while it seems silly or trivial, those would have been moments to kind of reset your thinking because you're sharing what's going on with someone else and they're giving you their perspective. So those natural rituals have kind of gotten stripped out of our work, working lives, leaving us more alone and leaving us more, more um, trusting our thinking, whether it's right or not. So, so maybe, was, maybe one of the antidotes is just maybe you should be going out to lunch a little bit more with your coworkers. I completely agree. I completely agree. In fact, you're sort of taking away my end of the show life hack. <laughs> 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 but, uh, 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 one of the interesting things that came up um, with the American Psychiatry Association's poll uh, was that one of the groups, everybody's anxious. It was across the board. There was no group of people that were exempt. Um, but millennials definitely had a higher level of feeling anxious. And there were a lot of theories about why this was happening. No, nothing completely clear that we can hang our hat on. But loneliness is definitely a factor. More people live alone today than they did decades ago. Mm. And fewer people, fewer people are involved in those community organizations like their church or their small town where everybody knows everybody. So they are more isolated. And so that makes lunch with your colleagues even that much more important. Yeah. Um, the other thing was contrasting that with social media, where now that whole idea of FOMO, fear of missing out, you're constantly bombarded with images. Yeah, beautiful people leading happy lives. And it's easy to forget that this is all uh, constructed. And this is all through a filter of I'm not going to post you know, the ugly shot, <laughs> and I'm not going to post when I was feeling, you know, sad or tired. So it almost amplifies that sense of isolation. Yeah. 
Well, I know, so I know we're at break, so let's roll into break um, because this was not only incredibly helpful, um, but when we come back from break, I want to then pivot into depression and, and what are some things we can do around that. I want to talk about how we can identify signs in our coworkers, and then I need some help with my 17-year-old daughter. So we're going to talk about that too. We can trade stories with my 16-year-old. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's go to break and we'll be right back. Here's your coaching minute for the week presented to you by the Leadership Foundry. So building credibility is essential to us as leaders, both in terms of working with our team, but also in terms of building credibility with others. One of the easy ways to do that is to focus on being more responsive. How responsive are you to emails, whether it's from your team or other leaders? That is a, as a good friend of mine and guest on regular guest on my podcast, John Kim says, responsiveness is cheap currency. And what John means by that is it's really easy to do, but it goes a long way. I had a leader I worked with several years ago and he would typically respond to emails four to six weeks after they were sent and he had no credibility with his team. So here's a challenge for you. Work on your responsiveness. Can you respond to emails within 24 to 48 hours? Now, what that doesn't mean is you have to respond with an answer. It can just simply mean, hey, I got it. I'll get back to you by whatever date. But by focusing on responsiveness, that can enhance your credibility. So give it a try. Welcome back from break. Of course, this is the Brandon Smith Show. And right before break, uh, Dr. Arafa Casavoy and I were talking about anxiety, depression, particularly anxiety. That was kind of the theme in that first section of our uh, podcast today and some ways that we can not only recognize it, but also some ways we can help prevent it or um, protect ourselves from it in the workplace. Uh, but we haven't spent as much time on depression. So I want to turn things to that um, co-pilot. Uh, and, and what are some things we can be doing to not only recognize depression, RFO, but even treat it or, or cope with it? Well, a lot of this preventive and recognition applies to anxiety and depression. So we almost don't need to focus specifically on one. More of it is mm. being aware of our mental health and that threshold of stressors, of when do they shift over the edge and have a life of their own. Um, so in terms of preventing, the classic, I'm just gonna do it really quickly because I've done it every time I've come, lifestyle is so important. So exercising every day is a great uh, way to get outdoors, especially if you do it um, with a friend and cross, uh, not cross it, but cross train. So you're doing different activities, challenging your body in different ways. We can't be overstated how important sleep is. And so getting up in the morning, going to bed at night, critical. Healthy eating is a big deal. And there are some links um, suggesting that the processed food sort of horrible diet that a lot of us have uh, could be linked in a associated with anxiety and depression and it's it's separate from the lack of healthy food there's something actually in our food water and air that may be contributing mm. to these higher and then they said sleep exercise nutrition and uh, we talked about mindfulness earlier the other is how we handle um, communicating with people. Mm. One thing I did last year, which I thought was really helpful, it was a very stressful year for me, was um, compassion training. And uh, I don't know how much you've experienced, done, know that, but there's a lot out there right now with empathy and compassion. And when, when we talk about empathy, I mean um, the ability to to step into another person's shoes mm. and kind of see the world through their eyes. And by compassion, it's being able to feel uh, their suffering and, and want to help that. And so when you're uh, taking these this compassion-based training course that I did, the first 
part of it was actually learning to be compassionate towards yourself. And it's really critical in terms of improving um, your, re- your own resiliency and reducing your level of burnout. And it has that long-term impact of reducing rates of um, your mo- likelihood of becoming depressed or anxious. One of the things they do um, in one of the, in the initial modules is have a moment of nurturing where you remember this moment in your time, a memory of when you felt safe and secure. And we all have these moments in our past that were markers of being upset or, you know, really big mistakes or, or sad. It's, it's less frequently that we remember the happiest moments. Mm-hmm. And so this puts you in a mindset where you can open up to that. And that's something I encourage people to do is like think about those safe, happy times and try to pull that in. And then when you're doing some mindfulness training, taking deep breaths, counting one to ten, um, doing yoga, reach into that moment and really um, and, and, and grab it. The next piece has been understanding how everybody around us is really more like us than different. And that keeps us more connected with people. So that person that might irritate you or that is challenging during work meetings or you feel like they're out to get you on you know, team projects and, and, and they're showing up, all of that, that kind of stuff. It's easier to look at an individual and say, hey, at the end of the day, we all want to go home to our happy family. And we want to be able to provide for them. At the end of the day, we want our company to be successful so that our job security is there and we have a product that we're proud of. We start looking at that, it's easier to let go of of these feelings of stress that can lead to um, worsening of a mental illness Hmm. and really be more uh, compassionate with um, our communications. Okay, so two things came to mind as you were talking. First was uh, an observation, and then I'll give my question. So my observation was, you know, I'm better at this, giving compassion to others, when I'm feeling rested. Yes. When I'm tired and a little bit worn out, uh, I'm not as compassionate to the driver that just cut me off on the road. Exactly. So I think there's a good, it's almost this, you know, you're, we're, it's a little bit of a cyclical both and kind of thing. We've got to take care of our health and it's, physical it's health. The, when they tell you to put the mask on first and then help your child. Yep. That person beside you. It's the same idea. There's um, quite a few excellent researchers out there re, um, studying empathy and compassion. And, and the conclusions are the same. When you take care of yourself and you're kind back to yourself and you're compassionate towards yourself, it's easier to feel that way to others. Okay. And, and things fall Place. Then that sets up my question. Why okay. is it so hard for us to be compassionate to ourselves? Wow, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that the big question? <laughs> because I can, I can speak for myself and everyone else I talk to. We, we tend to not give ourselves a lot of slack or the breaks that we need to because we kind of uh, push ourselves a little bit harder. We're just not as compassionate to ourselves. As we, I can find myself being more compassionate to someone else than myself. So I'm, I'm curious to any thoughts you've got on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure really why we're like that, why we're wired to, to push ourselves more and ask more of ourselves and not be as easy on ourselves. I know sometimes um, in families and I think leaders and work teams, we can project that onto the others around us where we might expect employees to do more than what really maybe they need to be doing. And we can speak to our children in a way that we wouldn't speak to anyone else, or at least we think we aren't. Um, And so it is important to recognize that it's not fair to ourselves. And we better be careful because there's an unconscious bias when we, we may be projecting that to other people when we're not kind to ourselves they they others know it and and they are concerned about you know what we're really thinking about them in return yeah i I will say in my just general life observations the folks that seem to do that the best that they are able to give themselves compassion and kind of know what they need and 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 move with that knowledge 
tend to be the folks either um, at or over retirement age. That's a little late. <laughs> I know, but they're they're seen. So I don't know. If, I don't know if there's a life wisdom that goes that's part of this. I don't know if there's a um, kind of a just just you know, letting go of ambition is part of this. I don't know if there's a chemical change because of testosterone levels is part of this. I'm not exactly sure. But it just seems like the, the people that I feel like have mastered this tend to be kind of uh, in, in that season of life. I do think that it's something similar to a muscle that needs to be exercised and trained and, and you do need to be conscious about it. So that in the work environment, creating a welcoming atmosphere where your employees feel like they can come talk to you about their stressors and that they know that that you'll be open to that conversation on how to make the end project get done, but in a way that's humanistic and fair. And we owe it to ourselves to make sure our home culture and our work culture supports all of that. And, and some of the things are, are, are simple fixes. Some are more complicated, but... Um, Making sure your team takes the vacations that they're allotted, that's a big deal so people mm. can go out and get rested and come back. When you're on a heavy project with lots of deadlines, maybe it's time to you know, bring in a healthy takeout because you know everybody's too stressed to like go get a proper lunch and they'll probably just eat snacks. At the end of that long day, figure out who can go home and put their out-of-office message on and not check their phone and and, um, and their computer. So these types of things build that culture where we can avoid worsening of stress that can lead to, you know, these mental health concerns we don't want to have it. Yeah, I love, I love just the intentionality of it, just being, oh, <coughs> excuse me, being aware and then trying to put in place, you know, uh, structures to support people. And I think that goes a long way. Just to, I love even the little tactical idea of who, who gets to go home tonight and turn their out of office on and no one's going to reach them. You know, so, so they've got space to just rest and recharge. Uh, that, that's beautiful. Well, well, Isaac just told me we're getting close on time. Um, okay. what, are there any other final thoughts you've got around this before I ask you about what I need to be doing in my household? Well, I did want to... Um tell people to remember about their employee assistance programs and the, the wellness programs because often those have incredible resources where you can get mental health counseling. The other big thing, um, and I'll quickly say this is one of the um, interesting details, one of the things most people are stressed about is they're um, paying their bills. And mm. so if you're stressed about money, that is going to bleed into everything else in your life. And these employee assistance programs often have financial counseling services. So taking that action step to go talk to, take advantage of these resources, get your finances in order, will sort of bring the fat one stressor down and that'll trickle down to everything else in your life. Yeah, it sounds like it's one more piece of that whole puzzle. We've got, we've got health exactly. and wellness, yeah. we've got relational, we've got work, we've got money. We've got emotions. We've yep. got all that stuff. Uh, okay, so we need to think about all of it. Uh, speaking of all of it, um, this has been a stressful, t stressful time in my house because my 17-year-old daughter is a senior in high school, and she seems really anxious about this whole prospect of applying to colleges and that yeah. whole thing is happening for us right now because we've got literally deadlines coming up. Early decision, wow. early action, all that stuff. It's happening. So do you have any tips on how to either that you've learned personally or that you've heard? How do you create a nice, relaxed, calm environment uh, in your house to kind of help things um, just not feel so anxious? I think acknowledging that this is a rough time and that there's going to be ups and downs is, is part of the battle. And saying, hey, we're going to roll through all of this together. And that gut check about what's in our control and what's not in our control is important. She has control over meeting the deadlines for the paperwork. 
Uh, she has control over writing the essays. At a certain point, though, she just has to let go and kind of recognizing that time where you just let it all go and know that there's so much more involved with the college acceptances than who she is, actually. And that takes, I think, a lot of the stress out because... She is a great commodity that any college will want. Along with that, and recognizing that the colleges are out there looking for the fit that they need, and they have thousands of great choices. So it's nothing personal for her. And that, again, to, I think relieves a lot of stress for people when they realize that so much of this is not personal. I, I got my phone out because I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, just have you talk to her tonight. <laughs> Because that was pretty much perfect. I'd always be happy to do that. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, it's really not about what college you attend. It's what you do when you get there and what you make of it. And she's amazing. So she's going to create her world wherever she ends up. And that's actually critical. The place you go doesn't make you. It's what you do. And they they are going to be so lucky to have her, whoever she, you know, wherever she ends up. Yeah. So hopefully that's some help. Because um, I feel that breaks down that long-term stress of where am I going to end up? It doesn't matter. She's going to be good wherever she goes. And her path will be there'll be some rough spots. They're going to be. But oh, that's okay. oh, oh yeah. We're, we're, we're dealing with the rough spots right now. <laughs> So uh, do, I know we're, we're probably a little over on time right now. What, what, uh, I always ask the life hack question. So what's our, what, what would be a good life hack for us on helping us to prevent dysfunction in our life, either personally or professionally? So right now in my life, uh, in terms of dysfunction, I'm really focusing on relationships and, and making sure all of my ducks are in a row with the people that I, I want to mm. be around. And I'm using at work and with a lot of friends, exercise as my go-to in terms of meeting up with people. I'm training for a two-day cancer walk, and so I'm kind of getting people out there to walk with me for a few miles, and I've had two coworkers, I've had friends, I've had family, so every couple of days I'm kind of booking somebody into that slot, and it's working really well because I get that alone time out in nature when I'm on my own walking, but then I really have some wonderful conversations uh, during the walking time. The other thing is I'm bringing my family into this, um, but along with exercising with my children and my husband and going out and, you know, paddle boarding or whatever we're doing, um, I am protecting dinner time Mm. because I family dinner is so critical. So even if the schedules are off where some of us are coming in and out, I just park myself on the dining table. I don't let myself get on the phone or the computer or start doing too many little side projects. And I just sit as if I'm having dinner with whoever's there and I talk to them. Beautiful. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Fantastic. So, Thank you. This was amazing. This was a gift for me, and I know it was a gift for everyone else who was listening today. Uh, if people want to learn more about you or follow you, where can they go? So I am on LinkedIn, and my WebMD bio is also available, and I'm on Instagram and Facebook, so please reach out. There are not a lot of RFA cast boys out there, so you see the name, it's, uh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, this was, again, awesome. And I think this was the third or fourth time I've had you on the show. So you are like one of our all-time favorites. So I'm so thrilled you were able to make it again and give us the gift of your wisdom and insights. It's it's already helping my home life. So thank you. I can't thank you enough. (laughs) And thank Thank you. you. And thank you for watching and listening. Of course, you can follow us every week where we drop a new show on Sunday evenings on Facebook Live. And hopefully you're listening on either iTunes or Stitcher and listening to the podcast. And if you're not, why aren't you? You should be listening to it on the podcast. So download it. And if you are listening on the podcast or when you start listening on the podcast, please rate review because that's really important for us so other people can find the show and we can grow our tribe and eliminate dysfunction in the world. So until our next show and the next time we connect, have a great week and an awesome life.